Hello everyone, I'm Michael Monti, Executive Director at ACSA, the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture. Happy Earth Day. This is a live webinar. Our three speakers have pre-recorded their presentations, but they are standing by live for the discussion at the end, which I will moderate. We encourage you to submit your questions during the presentations. You can do this in the chat interface on your screen. This forum is public, so people will see what you post there. You can also submit your questions through Twitter using the hashtag ACSAWebinars. The topic for today's presentations is integrative or comprehensive design. Long and important and often controversial aspect of the architecture curriculum, integrative design is seen by some as the place where the full array of knowledge and skills come together in a student's learning, while others see it as inordinately broad and too narrowly evaluated by accreditation teams. In selecting this topic, we wanted to start a conversation within the ACSA membership about how schools integrate this requirement into a broader curriculum of required courses and electives. We have three different schools to start this discussion, and I will introduce all of the speakers now. From the University at Buffalo State University of New York, we have Kenneth S. McKay, AIA. Kenneth has more than 20 years of experience in teaching architectural design studios, professional practice, and building systems integration. The founder and owner of Kenneth McKay Architecture, he has won several design awards for completed structures and has served as president of AIA Buffalo, Western New York, and on the board of AIA New York State. McKay received his professional degree in architecture from the University at Buffalo and a Bachelor of Arts from Colgate University. Both his built projects and his scholarly work focus on natural and artificial light, building systems in integration, and the role that each of these play in generating form and space. Next will be Kevin Stevens from the School of Architecture at the University of Tennessee. He joined the university in 2013 as lecturer and adjunct assistant professor, and now teaches courses in architectural design, building technology, and professional practice. Kevin is also the coordinator of the school's comprehensive design studio. Kevin holds a Bachelor of Science in Architecture and a Bachelor of Arts in Art History from the University of Maryland College Park, in addition to a Master of Architecture from Rice University. Prior to teaching, Kevin practiced for more than a decade with firms in Houston and San Francisco, working on planning and on residential, commercial, and research facilities. Finally, we have Matthew Trebitowski, who is an architect, a lead accredited professional, and an educator with two academic appointments. He is professor of architecture at the Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture at Taliesin, and an assistant lecturer at the University of Arizona. Trebitowski founded Blank Studio Design and Architecture in 2006. He has won numerous awards for the studio's design work and is published frequently in periodicals such as GA Houses, Architectural Record, Detail, Dwell, Blueprint, and Domus. Professor Trebitowski earned a master's degree in architecture from the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. And now we will start off with Ken McKay. Thank you, Michael, uh, for that introduction. And uh, thank you also for setting up this platform for us to discuss uh, this important topic. As many of you have um, been dealing with this over the last several years as the comprehensive studio and then ultimately integrated design has uh, become a more and more important part of our curriculum, I'm sure all of you have uh, struggled with it within your individual institutions. Um, some pertinent background information um, from my end. The University of Buffalo is a four plus two program with the accredited degree being the two year um, MARC, Master of Architecture. The four year undergraduate program is not our accredited degree. However, like many schools, more than half of the NAAB criteria are met within our undergraduate program. The decision to place the comprehensive studio in the third year of the undergraduate program was based on the desire to provide graduate research studios uh, the core of our uh, revamped graduate program, the freedom to explore a range of topics which would be unfettered by the responsibility to meet the range of NAEB criteria. 
The undergraduate studios at the University of Buffalo are coordinated studios. In other words, all the studios, as many as five studios within, with as many as 12 students in each studio at any one undergraduate level, work from the same pedagogical goals, project statements, building programs, and deadlines. Uh, by the way, uh, the coordinator uh, for each of the years um, works with the department chair. In this case, our comprehensive studio uh, was developed by our uh, chair, Omar Khan. The following is a summary of the basic pedagogical approach incorporated into the Junior Comprehensive Studio at the University of Buffalo beginning in the spring 2013 semester. That was immediately following the spring 2012 accreditation visit uh, in which we realized that we needed to look differently at our comprehensive studio than we had done in the past. Rather than move it had historically uh, been placed in the fall of the senior year, uh, Professor Khan um, took, I think, the bold approach at uh, deciding that the comprehensive studio uh, was move, should be moved to the third year of the undergraduate program in the spring. And the reason for that uh, was that uh, we would then get two shots at it. If it didn't quite work the way we wanted, uh, we could do it over again um, in the fall. Uh, the studio was further developed in the spring of 2014-2015. Um, in addition, a parallel approach was used with a comprehensive studio for incoming graduate students who had not had a comprehensive studio in their undergraduate institution. Uh, that was run in the fall of 2013, 14, and 15. So in summary, the approach to the studio has been refined over the course of five se consecutive semesters. Um, so what I'd like to present uh, rather quickly uh, and in, in summary is what I call six points towards a manageable comprehensive studio. In other words, summarizing uh, the debate over five consecutive semesters of as many as uh, 20 different faculty members uh, which had input uh, in trying to develop the best program we could. Uh, the first point is what I would refer to as simplicity. Keep the program requirements and code requirements simple, i.e. single versus multi-use building, um, but it hold the students responsible for adhering to the basic code requirements. Uh, we had had a terrific uh, senior housing studio that also incorporated mixed use. What we found that it was very difficult for students to be able to think about and to incorporate the mechanical systems and the structural systems for those two different types of requirements in their first uh, time attempting a building or a comprehensive studio. Two, familiarity. Use a familiar program to facilitate the student's ability to generate detailed plan layouts. Um, one of the things that we pride ourselves on in our studios is exploration. Uh, we decided that if we were going to be successful at having a very comprehensive approach to the studio and integrating design, we were going to have to simplify some of the criteria. So what we did was use an architect's office as the program, the office building felt like the right program relative to the open spaces of an office and how you would uh, work with the mechanical systems and the structural systems to integrate these two. Um, and it was assumed by using an architect's office that by the time students were in the third year um, of our undergraduate program, they would have already had an understanding of the workstation requirements for producing drawings and models. This knowledge was enhanced by a series of site visits to architectural firm offices at the beginning of the semester so that the students could see in local firms the different ways that various offices approach the workspace and the collaboration depending upon the size of the firm and the type of firm that we were visiting. 
we, the assumption was that it would be easier for students to develop detailed furniture layouts working with this and that it would facilitate an appreciation for the distribution of light and air if the students under had a, a sense of the detailed floor plan layouts and how work would occur within the space. Number three, I think we struggled uh, with prerequisites. In other words, and I, my assumption is that many schools struggle with this. Everyone who teaches uh, an integrated design studio or a comprehensive studio would like the students to know just about everything before they arrived. Uh, we took uh, what I would say was a fairly uh, radical approach. Uh, we worked with the assumption that information necessary to meet NAABE criteria, such as environment or structural systems, uh, do not have to be covered in another course before it is introduced into the studio. The studio environment is such that it can act as a tremendous motivator for students to research topics. Uh, depending upon prerequisites uh, can be problematic uh, if you're always asking the students to find, you know, bring, come in with more knowledge uh, from other studios, you're often, I think, uh, going to be disappointed. In addition, students will also, within any one studio, will come in with very different levels of mastery of other topics. Um, Students are very highly motivated when working on studio projects to address topics uh, from their other classes. Um, the uh, issue that we did have to face by taking this approach was that we had to make sure that a certain level of expertise existed on the part of the faculty relative to things such as understanding mechanical systems, understanding structural systems, um, and how those would be incorporated into the building. Code research. Um, one of the things that we did was uh, we did not believe that we it was our responsibility to go through detailed code research and have the students and present to the students uh, every requirement that they would need to address in their design. Uh, what we took was a very different approach. Our goal was to motivate the students to do their own code research and engage the instructor after the, they have come to an initial decision. In other words, instructors were encouraged to not tell students what the answer would be if they asked questions about code, but rather to direct them to the research uh, that had been placed on share drives or other um, uh, resources for them, and then to come to a conclusion. Um, an interesting anecdote about this is, um, in our third year, we uh, had a new faculty member who was teaching in the senior year. Uh, the faculty member uh, was uh, doing a desk crit with two students, and one of the students began to argue about code requirements, uh, and in fact was actually quite right in having done the research. And we kind of came away with some pride that um, our students were actually seeing this as part of the design process and not something that uh, was tangential to or something that, that someone else should do for them. Uh, number five, technical review. One of the things that we did was we developed a technical review after the schematic design review, uh, which was placed significantly before the final review. We invited outside practicing architects and engineers to the review. Uh, many of those had been architects whose offices we had visited, others who were members of the local board of the AIA. Um, one of the uh, nice, um, uh, Asides was that the strength in it, it strengthened the relationship between the school and the profession. It also uh, made the students uh, feel uh, like uh, to take pride in the technical aspects of their projects. It also did something that um, I f uh, that I had not seen, and that's that it focused the technical reviews by having people that were asked to come specifically and deal with technical issues. We didn't have students more than halfway through the semester being confronted with critiques in which they were told that their entire design needed to change. And uh, that seemed to work out uh, quite well. Uh, and finally, uh, the sixth point was products. Um, what we did was work to develop a set of discrete projects which provide cumulative documentation throughout the semester so that the students work meet uh, the NAAB requirements and are very clear in their meeting those requirements. Um, at the same time, uh, what we were trying to avoid 
what we often see in studio, studio is the students spending the last two weeks of their presentation gathering everything together and redoing their design. What we are trying to do is, is create cumulative projects across the course of the semester. So when I talk about, uh, when I mentioned um, in point five, the technical review, uh, if a student's design changes substantially after the technical review, we don't necessarily make them go back and change the mechanical systems or the structural systems. Our approach was that the student has already shown a mastery of how to, uh, and, a, and an ability to uh, incorporate those systems into their building. Um, if there's no need necessarily to have a finished product that shows all of those things integrated. It's the understanding and the ability to do that that's more important. Um, so th that's it. That's our story. Uh, let me let me pass this along to uh, Kevin Stevens from the University of Tennessee uh, for his take um, on integrated design in the curriculum. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, this is uh, actually kind of coming at a very interesting uh, time in our program as we're rethinking these very issues um, ourselves internally as we're moving from, say, the um, 2009 to 2014 NAB criteria. So it's a really kind of interesting opportunity. Um, one of the things we're trying to do within our curriculum that is a part of this uh, discussion is kind of moving our technology courses from what might be understood as kind of isolated silos to an experience which is more actively engaged in t across the entirety of the uh, curriculum. So a real effort being made to kind of rethink how this is delivered. Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting about the 2014 NAB uh, criteria is that we start to see a kind of emphasis of synthesis um, and over indexing of proficiency for the students. We start to see kind of emphasis on research pursuits, reconciliation of implications of design decision and research, synthesizing of, of variables and environmental stewardship. So it's a really exciting time for us. Um, the uh, integration studio in our curriculum kind of comes at a hinge point in our five-year PR program. Um, third year currently has the majority of our kind of quote-unquote technology courses, including uh, ECS and structures, materials, and methods. And the fourth year is uh, integration studio knits all of this together as well as a very rigorous uh, three years of undergraduate education. Starting from that point, we start to see the students moving more into self-directed projects, topical studios, and so forth, opening up for um, a whole series of kind of individual studies. So a real kind of interesting uh, point in the curriculum there. Um, the coursework itself for the integration studio in that fourth year, as you, as you can see here, um, consists of two directly related courses, 431 and 471, a studio and a lecture lab course. Um, that are kind of concurrent, and they meet five days a week every afternoon. Um, the studio is 1.30 to 5.30, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, and our lecture labs, 2 to 5. So we have the students for a total of nine credit hours for this, which is a lot of contact hours, um, not including the 421 course uh, representation, which is also related and tied in as well. So um, pretty uh, large time commitment on part of the studio uh, student, faculty and the students uh, at the same time. Um, the other thing I think that's really important to kind of understand about this as a kind of hinge point within the um, students' uh, experience here is that it's seen as a really kind of celebrated moment in their education. Um, that transition from the kind of rigors of the um, first three years, uh, the kind of um, demonstration of mastery of that content at the fourth before they move into um, the more open-ended um, courses is really um, kind of Something's kind of taken um, very seriously by both the students, the faculty, and our local practitioners. Um, here we kind of see one of the uh, semester in the award ceremonies. Uh, the AIA Middle Tennessee sponsors the Student Design Award. And one of our local um, uh, firms that has a great kind of commitment to our program uh, sponsors a Sustainable Design Award. So it's a really kind of competitive. We get broad-based buy-in across all of our kind of constituencies um, as a part of this. Um, so looking at a kind of typical staffing diagram for what we do, um, this is an example from this year. It's no, by no means kind of the um, 
complete roster of uh, people that are participating. But you can see between the design studio and the integrations uh, lecture lab uh, section, we have four faculty members in each of those uh, positions. Um, we have two faculty members that teach both the studio and the lecture lab course. Um, four faculty members for the lecture lab courses, um, it's important to note, um, are seen as a shared resource um, across all studios. Um, so it's not that there's a one-to-one -one relationship, um, you know, direct uh, between the, the lecture lab and the studio. Um, if my studio were to need um, some particular expertise and structures, I would have that access um, to bring in, um, et cetera, as would everybody else. So I'm real kind of a collaborative effort there. Um, as far as the courses uh, themselves go, you can see here again, um, they are distinct yet highly complementary. Um, each acknowledges and addresses the issues in the other courses. Um, taken together, they establish the groundwork for design work that is the basis of strong back and forth between exploration of kind of conceptual design issues and a demonstration of technical proficiency and synthesis. Um, we kind of say that there's a direct strong touch, if you will, um, between the integration studio and the lab lecture course, whereas representation is more kind of um, a light touch and it's getting stronger, but we start to see some of our exercises um, from studio courses showing up at those locations as well. So it's a good back and forth. Um, again, um, kind of a very, very committed uh, effort among the faculty and students to kind of understand those relationships. Um, this is kind of an example of kind of what uh, we start off with, with at the beginning of each semester. Um, the coursework, lecture, studio development, lab assignments, et cetera, are all carefully coordinated at the beginning of the semester. But the studio projects tend to range greatly in a given semester, um, depending on what the faculty is interested in uh, exploring. Um, there's a lottery that's held for each of the studios, and uh, faculty present that work um, and, uh, you know, kind of make it a uh, the um, projects in the past have uh, involved large lakeside museums, fabrication R&D facilities within a historical context, and multifamily housing projects uh, based on modular and 3D printed components. Uh, studio projects of different scales, programs, et cetera, tend to run parallel uh, with regard to larger scale issues being addressed. So there is a kind of continuity among them. Um, this makes it easy to um, develop, if you will, kind of um, quickness among the faculty um, where we can ad address um, specific assignments and lectures to target um, issues that we're seeing develop in the studio. So we have great flexibility there. And you can see kind of from this breakdown that the primary studies in the studio uh, for the first two uh, weeks or so um, run separate from the lecture lab. Um, they start to come into line more during the concept design phases. They're more complementary. And finally, as we move into design systems uh, and so forth, the, um, the assignments become much more directly related. Finally, the last several weeks of the um, uh, uh, semester, um, the lecture lab course is really seen more as kind of a direct consultant with regard to the studio projects. And we're bringing out in, in uh, outside expertise as well to assist the students with the development of the projects and to, uh, if you will, kind of make them defend that a little bit more um, than they might otherwise have to with just the faculty. Um, so this is kind of uh, one of the things that we really emphasize, that research and design issues are seen in parallel uh, by the faculty, but it can take a little bit of time sometimes for the students to come around to that. Um, the students are required to carefully document and organize all coursework um, so it is immediately accessible to both themselves and to the faculty. Uh, design work, sketches, spreadsheets, assignments, materials, press sheets, et cetera, are all collected in digital and analog form. Uh, and uh, kind of binders and so forth are reviewed and collected three times over the course of the semester to ensure uh, good studio hygiene. Um, the binders and so forth are also an integral part of final presentations. And again, that emphasizes the importance of this work. Um, a couple of examples of some of the early projects that we'll do in 431 while the studio is running. Um, this is a very direct and kind of straightforward uh, kind of assessment of an envelope resistant um, calculation. Um, again, building on and revisiting structure that was delivered in previous ECS and structures courses. Um, it's kind of getting their chops back in uh, order, if you will, um, before it kind of starts to show up directly in their studio projects. Again, it's a straightforward, clear project emphasizing how they access resources 
and how principles are applied. Another one of those examples, um, again, this one is kind of being run in conjunction uh, with the um, 421 representation course, uh, looking at a very straightforward scare assignment. Um, again, emphasizing code resource, uh, code research, um, uh, materials and detailing, um, and all those kinds of elements that come through, and at the same time, um, engaging uh, kind of the um, representational tools that are part of that. Um, one of the other components that we use really aggressively within our studies are um, both the AIA Community and Environment Measures of Sustainable Design and the USGBC Lead Certification Checklist. Um, these are really central to a large part of the discussion that we maintain throughout the semester. Um, the AIA code, um, uh, measures uh, are emphasized earlier in the semester. We tend to use those to foster um, much broader based discussion and um, identify broad based approaches. Um, and encouraging large-scale thinking about program and site. Uh, the lead checklist tends to be introduced a bit later in the sequence um, after general <coughs> conceptual directions for the projects are identified. Um, tends to be more concrete in its assessment, and quantification is a great um, leveler for this. So um, <coughs> these are both addressed in studios and the lecture lab courses equally, so we're constantly coming back and forth uh, to this information. Um, another thing that we start to see um, kind of as a result of this um, effort, which I think is really kind of telling about the program, are things like this. These are parallel in one of the binders. And on the left-hand side, we see a sketch of a central space within a project. And you can see a real effort there being um, used to develop a sense of place and spirit, um, father and son looking in exhibit, daylighting studies, how one manipulates a wall, section, um, and structure. And then on the right-hand side, we see a concurrent study of that space, which addresses issues of smoke control in the event of a fire. So those things are seen as with equal uh, importance as we um, move through these projects. Um, the projects are uh, reviewed often throughout the course of the semester. Um, and we make efforts to bring in as many different um, voices as possible as a part of that, um, faculty members, uh, not involved directly in the studios, practitioners from outside, engineers and scientists. Um, all of those perspectives um, are uh, kind of brought to bear on the uh, studios and um, play a huge role in opening um, the uh, students' eyes to the kind of constituencies that they need to deal with. Um, here we're looking at um, a reviewers from UTK and uh, Skidmore and Merrill reviewing projects. Um, as a part of the Governor's Chair Studio that was that, uh, uh, currently underway. Um, another element that we really uh, tried to attempt uh, with regard to these projects, uh, again, to kind of get the students to really kind of buy in and take ownership, is the students are largely encouraged to develop programming of their individual projects within the context of the larger studio brief and develop a real kind of personal take on that. Um, this builds on a third year design and research studio that um, is offered and encourages ownership of individual projects. Plus, um, we see it tends to open many avenues of different investigation and uh, encouraging um, discussion with regard to technology, et cetera, in respect to the appropriateness with regard to programs. So some real um, kind of interesting takes um, on different uh, uh, kind of technology as it uh, relates directly back to a programmatic ambition on the part of the students. Um, another example of that um, you know, kind of uh, effort is the constant play that we're uh, working to develop between the necessities of the building codes, the energy code, et cetera, and the development of concrete building proposals. Um, we've kind of joked that it's a, a play between developing sexy buildings and sexy spreadsheets, which is not always a kind of easy undertaking, if you will. And finally, we do try to um, make sure that we um, get outside feedback on these projects. So um, we've been uh, pretty um, kind of uh, uh, aggressive about kind of pursuing uh, kind of peer review. One avenue we use for that is the um, HDSA, AIA uh, Committee on the Environment um, uh, uh, Awards, and submitting projects for that. And it's also a good pro uh, opportunity for us to really kind of distill this work down again further and take pro, uh, presentations that were often 20 some feet long and distill it down into those four uh, 20 by 20 boards is a real effort. So here's an example of that. And ideally, I think one of the things that we start to see with these projects 
is that there's a richness and clarity um, to the thinking um, as a result of these efforts. Um, they start to see problems um, as opportunities. Uh, not only is there a technical proficiency to see this uh, in place, but also a kind of ability to deal with technical innovation and that environmental responsibility and stewardship are at the center of all that they do. Um, ideally, these are all present, present. And I think that one of the things we start to see in projects like this is that there's ultimately a real joy, um, I think, that becomes evident in the work. Um, so that's always kind of a really wonderful thing for us to see. So a couple more examples of some of that work um, kind of being wrote, uh, uh, kind of presented in short form, um, looking at, again, the environmental responsiveness being kind of realized across all levels of the project development as it's um, undertaken. Uh, a couple more examples of that. And we've been really fortunate and had good feedback um, in the first um, kind of uh, uh, awards we were cited for two of our projects out of the 10. Um, so we feel like we're kind of uh, really addressing the environmental issues very well, and the technical proficiency is really um, showing up at the same time. Um, we're also showing a kind of good um, kind of response and uh, you know, kind of ARE, um, uh, high percentage of passing, 75% pass, and 95% of our students passing above um, uh, uh, national averages. So on that note, I'd like to go ahead and turn this over to Matt and say thank you to everyone. And if there are any questions, please uh, contact me at any of these uh, numbers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, my name is Matthew Trebitowski. And I think one of the first things I'd like to, to start off a little bit uh, about with, with regards to how we deliver the integrative design studio or comprehensive design studio formally at, uh, at Cal ES and is to discuss uh, just a little bit about the scale of our school. Um, it is going to be markedly different than, than the sort of uh, quantity of students and the, and the quantity of, of faculty that, uh, that are on staff at, uh, at some of these other institutions. But, but that being said, we, it does offer us a certain nimbleness and a certain um, uh, ability to deliver the content in a, in a very unique and almost one-on-one -on -one way. We do have a very tight uh, student-to-faculty ratio, so we have um, a much more um, direct uh, integration, I think, with our, with our students and our staff. So the, the, the one thing about the, the integrated design studio is it certainly is uh, it very much a group effort. I mean, this, this first image uh, I'm showing here is, is one of the, the many iterative review processes that happen during the course of, um, uh, of a class. And it brings together basically our entire staff. I mean, everyone from our dean, Aaron Betsky, who is, who is in the photo, to um, uh, Keegan Quick, uh, to uh, Andrea Bertassi, uh, visiting fellows, um, staff, faculty. Uh, we, we have these, um, these moments where we can all come together as sort of a common mind. And we use the theme of, a, uh, of the one-room schoolhouse in that not only is, is, the, um, is the effect of how we deliver our content, but it's also how we review it and how we uh, integrate it uh, into our uh, sort of daily existence. Um, uh, starting off a little bit just about how, how this project is delivered or how this course is delivered in, in our institution, it really does start off with, with, um, with the syllabus. And, and, and this may seem almost a little, a little commonplace to, to those that uh, do this for, for a living. But one thing we've, we've become very attuned to, uh, specifically with this studio, is setting the expectations for the students um, but very early on and, and, and very clear. So I'm, I'm not interested in going through uh, the entire syllabus, but, but this is really our contractual document with our students to really prepare them for, uh, for what the end, um, end goal of this has to do. So you know, in addition to the, um, to the brief description of both the course and of what the, what the task is going to be, we're pulling from the ACSA and the NAAB um, um, guidelines and intended outcomes and building that right into not just the initial document, but every assignment and every um, um, uh, element that we deliver and evaluate along the way. So uh, you're going to see a, a similar course um, um, schedule uh, that you may have seen seen earlier. Essentially, we've been able to um, deliver the the project through a series of of both um, project tasks and then um, intermittent charrettes, and we basically developed that down to. Uh, down to a total of eight. So we followed architectural practice very, um, very uh, directly in that we introduce sort of projects and have your, your traditional um, uh, site analysis, um, project um, study, site study, case studies. 
and then work your way through different phases of development, which we're literally following schematic design development and then what we're calling resolution and refinement as our, as our CD phase. But then intermittently sort of introducing um, a different snapshot moments where we can focus and drill down into the things that, that really make the comprehensive design studio um, one of the more challenging ones, if you will. It's, it's things that can tend to like fall away if you're in the general design stream, you not get into that level of detail we'd be sure to take these snapshot moments and drill down into them. Things like specifically understanding site and analyzing, uh, analyzing the site, um, uh, stairs and egress systems, the structural uh, uh, systems and building systems, and uh, discussing building envelope systems, for example. The selection of the, of the program uh, varies per, per course. Uh, where this exists in our curriculum, it's in, in we're, we're a three-year master's degree uh, program, and this is typically occurs in the third year, and it would be the fifth studio. So after a pair of introductory and um, intermediate studios, this would represent the, the, the final sort of core studio. And we are also in, a, in, a, in obviously a, a moment of, of adjustment in terms of where this falls in our curriculum, I think with uh, uh, similar to, to all other institutions. We are beginning to consider moving this slightly up in the curriculum, try to, try to perform this earlier so we can have more of a, of a um, of a free final studio, more of a traditional thesis that um, is is not strictly um, in play right now, and this almost this course represents that last studio um, at this point. Um, so the the projects get selected um, from a variety of places. Commonly, we have been looking to the ACSA competitions. I mean, currently we are running the Timber in the City competition. We have done the um, some of the other. Um, uh, steel competitions and things in the past because they just provide both the complexity and sort of the richness necessary to, to sit and really explore um, over the course of the studio. Um, and we also sort of leave it in a way up to some of the students to say if they want to work in teams or if they want to do these independently. Uh, some of the larger programs we certainly would, would encourage um, more of a teaming, but um, but um, yeah, the, the, the individual option is on the table because they'd worked in team settings um, earlier in the curriculum. So in this instance, Timber in the City. And then um, over the course of a 16-week um, delivery, there's a, there's a twice a week meeting period, basically between 9 a.m. and 12.30 is the, is the studio meet time where, where uh, lectures, uh, primarily one a week, sort of get integrated. And these are the examples of sort of the ones that get delivered across the, the course of uh, of the of the term, both by the uh, teaching staff or by outside professionals, and we'll get some examples of those outside professionals here uh, in a moment. But we do directly try to simulate as much architectural practice as as possible. So when we have moments of um, structural integration and of uh, mechanical design and lighting and, and electrical design, we're bringing professionals in because we're small enough. We can have those consultant teams meet with our students with their project and 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 allow them to integrate that stuff directly into their work. You know, so I'll be in the room acting as sort of the moderator that you know, can ask the questions that, that need to be asked, but I also then have the eyes to follow up and making sure that stuff gets integrated into their work um, as they move forward. And again, it's always a, it's a common effort. Sometimes it's a team effort. Sometimes it's a, you know, designed by, um, designed by a challenge or by committee with, with people getting their hands on people's models and, and interrupting them. But we also obviously do um, the moment where we, we spread everything out and just have um, the, the charrette review sessions. In the foreground, you're sort of seeing someone take, um, uh, take review notes while, while redlining on the drawings is, uh, is occurring on the tables and on the walls. And these sort of snapshot moments are occurring basically at the end of each one of those phases. So at the end of each um, uh, uh, project delivery phase plus at the end of each charrette, we take these moments to, to come together so the students get um, ample feedback and, and response. Um, getting out visiting, visiting actual locations for, for, uh, for example, when we were working on the Culinary Institute, going out to sites to see this stuff. Um, so it's not as, as abstract as lines on a page, but you're physically getting to, getting to see that and, and really see how that gets integrated into, into the drawings and into the projects. Direct meetings with the consultants. Again, this is our uh, a structural engineer local here to uh, uh, to Phoenix, uh, who, who comes in and basically meets with each of the individual students about their independent schemes and, and works through uh, challenges and, and um, 
and opportunities with each of them. Uh, assessment is obviously one of the critical things. I think the, uh, the, the, the binder and the collection of prior work, the pinning up of work, the redlining, the marking up of things that, that get students in that, um, uh, in that vein. I mean, they've been exposed to this to this point, but it is wonderful to kind of teach at this level and be able to see the kinds of, uh, of notes that you put on a wall here or, or mark up get integrated um, thoroughly and completely and quite, um, quite competently by, by this level of student. Um, Keeping uh, a, a, bit of, a bit of assessment in mind, um, also at the ends of each of these milestones, to sort of see where the student is, because it, it is important to know kind of where you where you stand technically and competently. An example of um, um, just a, a straightforward evaluation um, sheet, and then um, visiting professionals. I think we have uh, right now um, an absolutely wonderful lineup of, of visiting professionals and, and lecturers. Every time a lecturer will come in, we will um, also incorporate them into our student um, uh, stream. For example, Todd Williams and Billy Chen in this instance. In our final review uh, boards, I think uh, Kevin was mentioning how do you take uh, you know um, 800 square feet of, <laughs> of printed material and uh, and distill that stuff down. But these are these are sort of those examples of of the models and the and the the wall space that um, that this kind of project can take up. And just a couple of examples of of those sorts of outcomes. So here's um, like one example of the of the full range of of output that would go along with with one of these projects and in a bit more detail, everything from, yes, the, the, the sexy images and the, and the visualization of this stuff, but the, 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 the true and competent um, understanding of, of integrating the mechanical and structural systems, integrating with site and with, uh, with surrounding context, a competent representation of, um, of you know, planimetric representation, and you know, we would have um, internal code reviews and things as we as we go along to make sure this stuff is um, is all met um, with with appropriateness, and then the level of detail that shows up into into all the drawings is um, is, is where the evidence of um, of integration really does rec does occur, and that you know builds up over time. So you're seeing the final versions, but then there's also five six versions of the uh, of the sketchy or built up stuff prior to that. And one other example of a, of a fully comprehensive version, working in models is, is becoming more and more um, um, important and more prevalent in this studio specifically, because we are um, mindfully sort of pushing that forward. But, but we do tend to want to have much more of a tactile experience, I think, in the, in the work, and, and trying not to make it as much of a studio about checklists and, and, um, uh, and, and accounting as possible, even though we're, we're very much aware of what, what needs to be accommodated and accomplished with that. We want to make sure there's there's still design and richness um, that's in this studio, and it's not simply the studio where you have to, uh, you know, show the trusses and show all the ducks. And then those moments of uh, of assembly and of material, and I think there's there's not examples in here pr um, proper, but I think some of the some of the physical collections of um, materials that that the students bring along with these as well, I think, is a um, is a great rich um, a great rich delivery of uh, of these projects. So, with that, um, that's that terminates today's uh, talk. So we look forward to hearing uh, questions and comments from everyone, and uh, we hope you enjoyed the uh, the presentation. Um. This is Michael Monty live from ACSA, and uh, we have uh, Ken and Kevin and Matthew. So I'm going to jump in with my first question after asking you to submit your um, uh, questions through the interface. So the first question to each of them is, um, what was the hardest part of implementing this into your curriculum, and what would you do differently? Ken, do you want to start? Um. <clears throat> uh, the, the hardest part was getting a full buy-in. Uh, from all of the faculty um, on how we were approaching it. Um, I'm, and actually, I don't need, I, I'm, I'm not sure that I could say that there was anything that was hard about this. I mean, it was really just, uh, we took the stance that we were going to develop this and adjust as we have went along, um, kind of looking at the products and seeing if the products, assessing them to make sure that they met what we believed was, was necessary. 
Um, uh, clearly, our approach is very different from example, for example, from uh, University of Tennessee. Um, ours was to try to keep it within our studio structure and um, to kind of expand within that studio structure outwards uh, to the local community rather than putting um, more responsibility on our faculty in-house to somehow attempt to integrate across courses uh, because uh, uh, we felt that that could be, um, it, it would create um, an added burden and um, it uh, the sequence of courses didn't you know, that we had didn't lend ourselves it didn't lend themselves to uh, doing that. But, uh, I'm interested to hear what others have to say. Uh, this is Kevin Stevens. I, I would agree that um, faculty buy-in is one of the most critical parts, uh, as well as student buy-in. Um, and luckily, we had that here. Uh, I think we were all, as a faculty, on board with that. Um, I think that one of the biggest issues that we faced was just the sheer volume of information that needed to be uh, covered in the course. Um, the students had seen that information before in a lecture format, um, but again, kind of actually seeing it in application was a very, very different um, kind of discussion, and that's where the 431, our kind of supplemental course, really came in and uh, helps with that, where we can kind of develop pointed exercises in parallel with the studio work uh, to kind of bring that about. Um, but again, just the sheer volume of information that the students have to process, and not just process, but really synthesize into, you know, a kind of a, a great form-making uh, uh, kind of tool is, is really, really difficult. Yeah, this is this is Matthew. We we had um, sort of a, of course, a, a similar challenge, and not that the uh, uh, the amount of information you know per se needs to sort of all be crammed in here but yeah the responsibility suddenly was on the other studios and the other experiences upstream to make sure that that those indeed were sort of prepping um, you know prepping the situation for when they got into into this studio that that as much of it was was um, was sort of in play and in everyone's ear and in not just in lecture format but they'd been literally experiencing it and, and testing it to, to certain levels and in, in other places so um, I mean you saw the the the, the lecture um, stream that went along with this studio so there, there is kind of a constant reminder of this is this is where we're at here's a refresh of, of the things you have just done and here's how we have to integrate them here so there is always that touchdown within this which which does indeed mean it's, it's, it's a lot to cover and a lot to get in but but um, but the more we could could prep to make sure they're coming in with uh, with more of those skills was was really more the adjustment we're, we're working on on our side uh, so the I'm, I'm trying to combine some of the questions that are coming in through the interface and people can download the slides through the interface as well um, so we'll start with Matthew and ask each of the question uh, presenters to respond um, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, people are asking essentially about how you calibrate um, the studio to emphasize some kinds of content or the appropriate levels of content for an integrative studio. So one person asked about form making, addressing that in the studio. Another person asked about fire safety. So you have kind of two ends of a spectrum on that. And I wonder, Matt, Matthew, if you would, um, how, how would you address kind of the way your, you and your faculty um, calibrated the studio? It's, it, it, you know, when we when we looked very carefully at what the what the comprehensive design standards needed to be met in terms of what the NAB put forward, it it definitely tended to lean more on the 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 practical professional side of things, the the, the true evidence of integration of structural, mechanical, life safety, fire separation, those kinds of things. So, starting with that being the the baseline, um, really that's that's sort of where the where I think the the line was drawn. But then. If that is the only focus, then that really becomes very dissonant to what the rest of certainly our school is about and, and what I feel this profession really should be about. So the joy of design, the joy of making form, the joy of really understanding place and material and manufacturing and assembling and, and, and doing things is, is immediately um, is immediately sprinkled over the top of that. You know, the baseline assumption is, you know, this is the place we have to really have to tune our focus in a slightly different way. But we never ever allow ourselves to lose sight of, of the joy and of the uh, of the expectation of designing spaces and places and objects for, uh, for human beings in in a real world. Kevin, how about you? Uh, I agree. I mean, I think that the, you know one of the big uh, you know issue is to make sure that these are issues like fire safety and all that are not running the show, so to speak. 
Um, and one of the things that we do is, you know, again with our studios is we start off with kind of a programming phase. And, you know, those first two weeks we're running the, the 431 and the 471 completely separately um, with an effort that, uh, intent that the, the studio can really take off in the form that a traditional studio would, developing a rich conceptual basis. And then bringing the rest of those issues such as the structural system selection, mechanical distribution, um, into alignment with those conceptual ideas. So we see them both as very, very complementary. And uh, if one were to kind of override the other, I think it would be very, very problematic for us. Sure. And how about Ken? Uh, <clears throat> well, when we made the decision to move it down into the uh, undergraduate in the spring of the junior year, so that was uh, there were five previous studios, we had to make some decisions about how we could um, um, uh, restrict um, some of the exploration, um, given that we had to meet all of the criteria. So part of that was to focus on um, an office building for our architects, uh, starting with the workspace. And then the other uh, from the outside was to restrict the site. So by restricting the size of the site and the context, we could limit the amount of form exploration that the students were taking. Um, and, but we were satisfied that they were having enough opportunities in their other studios, in undergraduate and graduate, to be able to, uh, that we weren't um, denying them opportunities that they weren't going to get elsewhere. So it was very much a, an orchestration of what the restrictions are so that we could uh, be able to get the students to focus on the topics that uh, you know, were important. Sure, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, um, do any of you use um, specific assessment instruments that, that um, particularly if you have um, undergraduate students and then first year graduate students, it sounds like, or graduate students that didn't come in with an architecture degree taking um, the comprehensive studio as well. Do you have any um, issues with, with, with having um, uh, those students? Do they, do they take uh, the, the studio together? And, and how do you assess um, their output? Can you say more about that? Kevin, do you want to start that? Um, let's see. In terms of the, uh, our graduate students, our graduate students are in a completely separate track from the undergraduate. Um, though the, um, again, kind of the course structure, the pairing there is, uh, is very, very similar. Um, I think in terms of the, uh, the instruments for assessment, um, they are complementary. Um, in, in the lab lecture course, uh, we have very straightforward assignments that are uh, either correct or they're not, uh, such as stair design and things like that. Whereas in the studio courses, we're looking at those stairs, same set of stairs uh, if in the context of, of, of the design uh, basis for the project. So each, each course for us tries to develop a set of instruments that are appropriate to what's going on in that course. Uh, towards the end, uh, the, the lecture lab and the studio are much more complementary, and so we see the, the instruments there, reviewing of assignments, uh, pinups, and so forth. Uh, taking place at the same time at that point. So it's a, two separate streams, if you will, that kind of converge into, into a single uh, assessment at the t towards the end. Um, Kenneth, how about you at Buffalo? Uh, <clears throat> I, we use the same assessments that we've used in all of our other undergraduate studios. I should clarify that when I talked about a graduate uh, studio, it was assumed in our graduate program that if you came from our program, you did not need a comprehensive studio. What we found is that uh, the majority of students coming in from other schools require it, uh, especially international students, because they, they may not, even though their portfolio could be quite sophisticated, There's we need to show that there's evidence of having taken a comprehensive studio. So the evaluation criteria is a bit different, and it's much more explicit. And, I, and the size of it is such that I teach that uh, not as a coordinator. It's simply my studio. I see. But with the, with the co coordinated undergraduate studio, uh, we do have a set of criteria uh, for the technical review. You know, you have to have these products. So the, for, for each of the five reviews we have throughout the semester, there is a specific set of products that the students need to produce. 
And and so you essentially have an index of of of, of what do you use that in any of the NAB accreditation review or in any any other formats for the program that kind of assessment? Um, that's part of our syllabus. So that as the comprehensive studio, the, the work will need to meet this requirement. And then the products that we set out throughout the semester. It, um, our program is very much about orchestrating uh, the student's success, understanding why they need to do that this semester, providing them with the information um, and the track through it. But at the same time, we try to keep it uh, very similar to our other studios. Um, and Matthew, at a highly individualized program like Frank Lloyd Wright, can you talk more about um, assessment procedures or forms or instruments that you might use? Yeah, sure. Our, our, our assessment is at, at this juncture, where, where this lies in our stream, um, it, it's identical amongst you know, whoever our, our student body is, and, and you're correct. We do have a very wide range of, of student types, primarily coming from um, very varied backgrounds you know, that, that aren't necessarily design or, or architecture um, uh, intensive or in, involved at all for that matter so that's why the the positioning of this is really where it is in our curriculum and why the the prior studios really need to get um, the, the the studio sort of uh, the, the student prepped and prepared for uh, for for this period when it gets to uh, uh, to their third year but but in terms of assessment the, um, we're basically working very much off the NAB um, standards that are that are necessary we build that into the to the tasks and and evaluate them um, equitably across to, across the student body. Great. Um, I think we have time for about one more question. And I'm going to uh, quote uh, Bill Carpenter, one of our distinguished professors, I believe, who's watching, and ask the question about um, it, when, so NAB changed its, its, its conditions from the comprehensive design studio to the integrative design studio. Was there, a, what, in, in, from your program's perspective, is there a difference in mindset? What's the difference between comprehensive and integrative in, 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 in your mind? Uh, we'll start with Kenneth. Um, <clears throat> uh, integrated building systems uh, seems to me like a historical topic. Um, and that really we should be moving towards uh, performance-based design uh, using the programs that are available to get the students to really thinking about the, the, the building as a set of systems that are working towards environmental performance. Um, so um, I would say uh, no, I haven't changed as the coordinator <laughs> the, uh, our approach. Um, uh, we are continually upgrading thinking about what we can do next, how we can use more software, how we can get the students to, to really think about current issues. Um, so the change in the title has not been a big deal. Nominal. Matthew, how about you? Yeah, uh, I, we, yeah we, we feel the same. Um, it, it, I think that the, the term integrative is it's certainly much more natural and I think much more um, much more attuned to how we as professionals uh, tend to work and, and quite frankly to look at the the, the specifics of, of comparing it to, to comprehensive as the standards were before versus integrative now, it, quite honestly, it's become a bit easier <laughs> to, to address. So in a way, it seems like some of the, um, some of the super critical um, uh, rubrics may have, have either um, lightened a bit or, or fallen away. So I'm, I'm, we haven't changed a thing in terms of how, how the execution is, is occurring yet, other than just changing the title of the course. But, but uh, I'm sure slowly we're going to be, we're going to be integrating other, uh, other methodologies here. Sure, uh, I, I, I agree with both. Ahead, we're, we're looking at this really carefully at this point in time, and you know the idea of integrative and trying to find ways that were more performance-based in design as opposed to just kind of solving the problem, so to speak, but letting the you know the systems be a real form generator and an inspiration really is a, is a major task, and we are as a faculty actively looking at that very carefully, trying to constantly update those uh, ways that we approach these. So it's, it's a really good question. Well, we are out of time for this webinar. We're going to make it available online for people to view um, afterwards. I want to thank our three speakers tonight and everyone in the audience for hanging on. Um, we're sharing all the questions that you submitted, whether they showed up on the public interface or not, to the um, uh, speakers. You can see their uh, email addresses on the final slides, so if you want to follow up with them, we encourage that as well. So for ACSA, this is Michael Monti signing off. Thank you all.